And we are back once again. It's the Horror Guys. With another great week of movies and a short. We do. we got four movies and a short. As always, I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And what are we talking about this week? Some really interesting things. We have that new movie, Cocaine Bear, and an oldie called The Flesh Eaters. Which sounds a lot cooler than it was. <laughs> yeah. And a werewolf movie called Skinwalkers that had Which a lot of action. also sounds a lot cooler than it was. <laughs> and Colossus, the Forbin Project. Which sounds really dumb, but it was actually pretty good. Yeah, that was really cool. I was impressed by that. I, I wasn't expecting it to be as enjoyable as I, as, you know, as it was. It was. You had not seen that one before. I had not. Somehow I missed that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so those are the four movies this week. The Colossus, The Forbidden Project, Skinwalkers, The Flesh Eaters, and Cocaine Bear. Over at HorrorBulletin.com, we've got a couple of additional movies you could read about. We've got Fulci for Fake from 2019, which is a sort of a faux documentary, documentary about Lucio Fulci. Yeah, and it, it's weird because... It's weird. Yeah, it's a guy who's hired to play Fulci in a documentary. But not really. But not really, and he spends the entire thing saying he's going to learn how to be Fulci, and so he goes through this process of learning all about him and interviewing people that knew him and everything. So it's a weird choice. It's a, it's an interesting way that it was done. I mean, basically, yeah. basically, he goes around and talks to people who knew Lucio Fulci and talks and to them about his movies yeah. and his, the, the, mm-hmm. the family. The one, the one daughter in particular really talks to a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's a straightforward documentary. Except instead of just pretending to be an in, instead of being an interviewer, he's pretending to be an actor who wants to learn about it. It's just kind of a weird choice, mm-hmm. but, but it makes it interesting. Yeah, if you're interested yeah. in Fulci's films, this is something cool to watch. Obviously, he's been dead for a long time, so he's not in it personally. <laughs> but how Fulci became Fulci? Yeah, yeah, his whole story. And then there's the Munster's Revenge from 1981. Which, you know, it was kind of nice. It was the final outing for the original cast, the original three lead actors. But it wasn't very good. It was kind of made for TV. It, didn't it was have, made for TV. It didn't have a laugh track. And it was kind of stale humor. Yeah, just, this, this one was not nearly as good as their previous works. Yeah, it had the main three cast members, but they were all getting kind of so old. Was, and so they weren't really into them for it. the last time. But yeah, yeah, kind of phoned it in a little bit. Yeah, it was, it was kind of meh. And they did the same jokes over and over and over. Yeah, the Phantom. The Phantom right. of the Opera got yeah, old like his, real his, fast. Yeah, he had a super high pitched voice that would shatter glass, and you know, but he kept doing it over and over. But it was also necessary for the plot. So yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. As far as our books go, we're not going to plug those too much. The Horror Guys of Peter Cushing is the Horror Guys Guide to the Films of Peter Cushing is out now, available at Amazon or Kobo or Barnes and Noble or Apple or horrorguysshop.com or any of the places where you get good books. Mm -hmm. And you can also go over to horrorguysshop.com and pick up the Horror Guys Guide to the Halloween films absolutely for free. Exclusively on the web store. Yes. Yep. And at no cost. There is a paperback book you can get through Lulu if you must, but uh, why? Why you get it for free in the store and ebook? The ebook. Yeah. And of course, all our other books that we're not going to read that whole long list there. But if you go to horrorguyshop.com, you'll see those. Mm-hmm. And as always, if you are new to the show, all our reviews are available on the weekly newsletter at horrorbulletin.com, and the ones we talk about here are available at Horror Guys. Dot com, our main site. You so betcha. Many different ways to get our stuff. Uh huh. If you want to consume horror films and consume horror reviews. And what if you want to consume cocaine? Then you've got to go out to the woods. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cocaine Bear 2023 is our new movie of the week, directed by Elizabeth Banks, written by Jimmy Warden, stars Carrie Russell. Alden Ehrenreich and O'Shea Jackson Jr., hour and 35 minutes, trailer in the show notes. And it's got a pretty big cast, actually. It's got a lot of people yeah, in it, a lot of re- recognizable faces. A lot of recognizable faces, faces. Yeah. yeah. Spoiler free, what kind of happens? Well, it's a little bit of a thin story stretched out into movie length, but it's so funny and well made that it's forgivable. And the humor is balanced with some really gruesome animal attacks, so it has that horror thriller element to it. And all in all, yeah, I think we liked it. Yeah, the plot is simple. A bear Mm -hmm. gets high on cocaine and does a rampage. Yeah, that's about it. (laughs) That's not a big spoiler. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, what happens, I'm not going to spoil the entire thing, but getting into it, 
It's back in 1985, so there's no cell phones. Mm -hmm. Convenient that. Conveniently, yeah. A man on an airplane wildly throws packages overboard as the credits roll. He then jumps out of the plane, but he hits his head and knocks himself out before pulling the chute. Oops. Yep, oops. (laughs) We cut to another couple, Christoph and Elsa, hiking in the woods. They pass some of the packages from the airplane, as well as a huge, seeing huge bear prints in the mud. They soon see the bear and takes pictures of it acting strangely. It's beating its head against a tree. <laughs> the bad CGI bear soon chases them through the woods and kills Elsa. This is probably a good place to talk about CGI. I think fur. My, I think the problem is fur is hard to recreate. Be. Yeah, because so often furry animals don't look so great. Remember Prey, the Predator movie? That, looked that had really a big bear excellent. in it too. The Predator oh, the, looked oh, the good. Predator, the Predator looked good. But there yes. was a bear but in that that looked bad. Not. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if it was the same same modeling thing. The Could same be. bear. Yeah. My theory is that fur is hard to do. Could be. And make make realistic. Well, then we see a news report about a huge drug drop from an airplane, but the man from the plane died on impact. We cut to the cops, who say there's a lot more cocaine out in the woods somewhere. Detective Bob then asks Officer Reba to babysit his dog. That just seemed like a weird storyline there. There's all kinds of weirdness in this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Elsewhere, David meets up with Sid, the head of the drug cartel. They also know that there's a lot more drugs out in those hills, so Sid orders David and Eddie to go out there and find the missing drugs. Eddie is so broken up over his girlfriend's death from cancer that he didn't even notice that the tattoo artist put John on his chest instead of Joan. So he walks around with John tattooed on his his chest. (laughs) Sari gets a call from the school. Her daughter, Dee Dee, and her friend, Henry, Henry have ditched school to go biking. Hiking 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 in the woods. The The two kids immediately find a brick of cocaine, and they each dare each other to eat a big spoonful of it, which they try, which has no effect, which is strange. Yeah, I, I, I'm I've not, never eaten a spoonful of I've cocaine. I've never eaten a <laughs> spoonful, but I think there would be some effect for little... I mean, and These are not, like little kids, like eight or nine, They're probably. not very big either. Yeah. It seemed like there would be some effect. Yeah. And we see the bad CGI bear behind them, and he sniffs cocaine all over them. He sneezes it. Sneeze, yeah. Yeah, he Phew. sneezes He sneezes it. quite a, a bit. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He's really relishing all the powder. <laughs> yeah. Powder flying okay. everywhere, but we, should, I, we shouldn't spoil it. Yeah, there, than there's that. not much more to talk about here without well, spoilers. Yeah, there's there's a lot of weirdness. Yeah. There's a lot of weirdness. <laughs> yeah. It's more comedy than horror. It is, but yeah. it's definitely got the elements. Uh huh. Yeah, because there there are some gruesome deaths. Yeah. No, there's some good gore too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this was Ray Liotta's final film, and unlike a lot of people who did, you know, like died halfway through the film or something, he does have a full part to play. It wasn't just a little cameo. He's a real character. Uh huh. And, well, at one point, some guy gets his pinky and middle finger <laughs> shot off. And how do you do that? With one bullet. With, uh, yeah, how does yeah, that the, happen? Yeah, the ring finger is still there. <laughs> yeah. How does that happen? <laughs> All right, well, I've already mentioned that the CGI bear isn't going to fool anyone. But other than that, it's very funny and much better than we expected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was pleased. We were expecting just cocaine joke after cocaine joke and... There's well, plenty of those. There is, but, yeah, but yeah, it's but not overdone. It's actually good. Lots of other humor in it. Yeah. yeah. So we definitely both recommend that one strongly. Maybe not for the horror elements, but it's <laughs> sure worth watching. Yes. All right, then we go back in time to 1964, black and back before color was invented, it mm-hmm. seems like. Yeah. And special effects were just barely going. <laughs> the Flesh Eaters, directed by Jack Curtis, written by Arnold Drake, stars Martin Kosleck. Byron Sanders, and Barbara Wilkin, hour and 27 minutes. Trailer in the show notes if you've never heard of this one. I never had before we saw it. I don't know. I I may have seen this one. It was on TV 100 years ago, but Mm -hmm. I didn't remember it. Well, it's got a surprising amount of gore, considering the age of the movie and budget. One guy gets his face eaten off, and yeah, it's, it's... Kind of messy. Yeah, yeah it Black is. and white, though. Yeah. There is a decent story, some horror tension, decent acting and direction, but don't overthink the science. Yeah, the science is pretty bad, isn't it? All right, well, this one's like 60-something years old, so you're <laughs> probably going to read the whole thing here. What happens? We can spoil the heck out of it. Well, Anne and her boyfriend, Fred, are out on a boat. He's kind of annoying. They both jump in for a swim. 
There's a strange noise. They both sink to the bottom and bubbles come up as credits roll. Uh Uh-oh. Something got them. Well, Jan Letterman wants to hire Grant Murdoch's plane to take her and Laura to Provincetown. There's bad weather coming in, but she offers triple his regular rate. Well, the engine starts to cut out even before the storm. She paid too much. Yeah. So they land on a deserted beach, and they must hide on the airplane before the storm hits. Laura is a drunken movie star, and Jan is her assistant or secretary, personal assistant kind of thing. And as they walk along the beach, they run into Professor Peter Bartell in his wetsuit. Now, considering what comes later, Mm -hmm. he gets out of the water in his wetsuit. Wetsuit. Wetsuit, yes. Uh Yeah. Yeah, there's something in that water. Well, he avoided him. Later on, he gets in that same water with his web suit and wetsuit. Why do mm-hmm. I call it a web suit? Web suit. It's not Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, he gets in the water in his wetsuit and it goes badly. Yeah. Well, he. I, I think they, they they expanded. I think they hadn't expanded as much, and he knew to avoid them. He uh, recognized them. I all right. Yeah. But what happens next? Laura soon stumbles across a skeleton in the sand. It's what's left of Anne. And it's still got the bikini in its hand. <laughs> I thought was a kind of a funny touch. <laughs> Peter blames sharks, but, you know, sharks don't strip people to the bone like that. And they go to Peter's tent and see his creepy bird. Do we ever of... actually see this bird? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just, we do. It doesn't uh-huh. just make noises. Yeah. I assure you we are in for a good pounding, Peter says, as the storm ro- rolls in. <laughs> One of the better lines <laughs> Morning comes, but the wind is still too high to take off. Jan says that Laura has some mental issues that keeps her from acting. Plus, she seems like an alcoholic, or aging alcoholic. Like, can't help herself alcoholic. Gran is suspicious of Peter, who's been deceptive about the sharks. He knows sharks didn't clean out that skeleton. Mm -hmm, He knows better. Peter is clearly jealous of Grant, and he thinks that Laura's interested in Grant, but she's really only interested in getting more booze. She ends up biting him and running away. She goes back to the plane for her bottles, but passes out on the beach. Peter finds a glowing fish skeleton, and then he finds Laura passed out and unties the airplane. Ah. Uh Uh She'll get the blame for it, yeah. Well, Grant finds some dead fish, too, and Peter theorizes it might be a parasite of some kind. Grant decides it's time to get off this island, and then they find... Laura next to nothing but the plane anchor, with no plane. And naturally, they blame her. Grant spots something glowing in and the water. And she was so drunk, she doesn't know if she did it or yeah, not. Yeah, she blacked out, and she she admits, you know, I might have done it. You know, so. Yeah, well, Grant says there's something glowing in the water. It's something alive. And there are millions of the little things in the water. <clears throat> well, Laura finds her booze-filled suitcase out on the rocks, goes after it. Grant rescues her, but he accidentally steps in the bubbling water. It's uh, infested, and that's kind of a tense scene, you know, where the stuff is all around him, and they're trying to balance on the rocks, and he's trying to get her back to the shore. Well, he cuts off his pants leg, and it's a boiling, bloody mess under there, where the things kind of dissolve the flesh, because they are flesh eaters. They are. Yeah. They're like microscopic or something, but Mm -hmm. it kind of looks like he's depth-stepped in acid, basically. Yeah. Well, Peter cuts the things off and they tie his leg up. He also collects a few specimens in a cigarette case, but it quickly burns a a hole through the metal. Oops. Trying to get to him. Yeah, these things are persistent. Well, Peter says it's okay. His supply boat is coming tomorrow and they'll be able to leave that way. In the meantime, some guy floats up on a raft and the glowing silver dust things that eat flesh crawl up onto his raft and start burning his feet. But he makes it onto shore. Peter cuts his sandals off. He's Omar, who's kind of a stupid beatnik hippie type of guy. These mid-60s movies always seem to have one of those kind of guys in it. Yeah, a beatnik. <laughs> well, we cut to Matt and Jim elsewhere, two sailors that run the supplies to Peter. Matt gets into a boat and heads to the island. Yay, helps on the way. Well, back on the island... Grant asks Peter about his huge solar power unit. Why does he need so much power? He demonstrates on some sample creatures. He electrocutes a bunch of them in a beaker. He only wants to run a long wire to the beach and electrocute the ocean, which doesn't really work like that. No, you can't electrocute the whole ocean. Yeah. 
Well, about 55 minutes later, the flesh eaters come back to life, the ones that he zapped in the beaker. 55 minutes later? Exactly, yes. Was it? Well, not for our time, for his time. We yeah, see it on their clock. Yeah, that's right. He timed it, yeah, because science. <laughs> but Peter does keep that to himself. Matt comes up in his boat, but the flesh eaters eat his flesh. Yeah, so much for the rescue. After that, Peter puts one of the things in Omar's drink. Just, you know, for experiment, because science. You see what happens. Yeah, well, the things eat their way out, which is kind of gory. Yeah, for an old film like that, especially. Laura goes back to the tent and finds the flesh eaters that Peter experimented are, in fact, not dead, and it looks like they are growing. They're she getting knows, bigger. They're getting yeah, bigger. Yeah, this is a problem. So they're not just in the water now, they're on the land. She knows that Peter knows more than he's telling and goes to Peter to pretend that she's joining his side. And he leads her off into the hills and she thinks she's got the upper hand, but he stabs her to death and then buries her body. Except we see her hand reach out of the dirt. Not dead. Not so dead after all. Grant accuses Peter of losing their plane, so Peter pulls a gun. He reveals that the Nazis developed a strange virus that would consume only living matter. It was developed as a biological weapon that would kill the entire fish, fish supply of a continent and starve out the enemy. That That's, wouldn't have any unexpected side effects, would it? Well, it's just, you know, the ocean is awful big and hard to contain them once you release them. So, that too. Yeah, yeah. Well, he plans to sell these uh, creatures to the highest bidder as a weapon of mass destruction. He's cultivated them and he's improving them. Well, but meanwhile, back in the tent, unaware to anybody, the growing flesh eaters eat Peter's bird. And, no more of that squawking. And they're getting bigger. Well, at gunpoint, Peter has Grant throw the electrodes into the water to test his electrocution project. He thinks it'll just stun them. And, you know, then they can be captured and transported or sold or whatever. Well, Jan goes back to the tent, finds the bird has been eaten, and Nobody at this point knows that they get bigger and wake... Well, mm -hmm. they know they wake up. Yeah. Peter knows they wake up. But yeah, nobody knows it, that they get bigger. He thinks it just stuns them and then they'll wake up later and be fine. But they... Yeah. Well, she realizes that electrifying the flesh eaters only makes them grow and becomes more dangerous. So she runs back to Grant and Peter, but it's too late. They've already zapped the water. Which I guess, you know, they could zap a chunk of, you know, the, the stuff close to shore. Well, the tent thing's now bigger than a car. Peter points out that the sea is now cooking up a monster a hundred times bigger than this one. Well, Laura pops up out of nowhere and attacks Peter. He shoots her and pushes her into the monster. She hits it in the eye with a knife, and it dissolves. Oh, wait, it wasn't the knife. It was her blood. Blood kills the flesh eater. Because science. Grant thinks they could rig up some kind of huge hypodermic needle containing their blood. Okay, good science. Peter uses a syringe to draw blood from each of them. And Grant goes out after the big new monster in a wetsuit, followed with the needle. Now wait a minute. Blood mm -hmm. kills the flesh eaters. Yes. What happens when you eat flesh? You bleed. There's blood, yes. yes. Wouldn't their food just poison them? It sure seems like it. Shh. Don't think too hard. Don't think too hard on this. Well, for some reason, Peter decides to pull a, gr a gun on Grant before he battles the monster. And Peter ends up going for a very brief swim and then shooting himself as he's being eaten. That web suit did wet suit didn't help that time. No, no. Well, then the big monster surfaces. It's bigger than Godzilla. Grant wades out to it in his rubber wetsuit, jabs it in the eye with his blood-filled hypodermic, and the creature explodes. Happy ending. I guess maybe only if you get the blood in its eye. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. Well, he then goes up to the beach with Jan. They're still trapped on the island, surrounded by the original small flesh eaters, and their plan to electrocute them only makes things work, uh, makes things worse, and so we don't know what's going to happen next, but... Sort of happy ending. They're they're <laughs> alive and they're together and they like each other and so, yeah. Well, the special effect for the sparkly little monsters is pretty neat considering the time period. Looks like something maybe you'd see on Star the old Star Trek show, just little sparklies. Yeah. Uh -huh. Martin Kosluk plays the mad scientist well, and Byron Sanders does a pretty good leading man here. The big monster at the end is pretty awful, 
but roughly the same as the other films of the period, so I'm not going to single this one out. It's a big monster from the 60s. Yeah, it is. Rubbery looking. It's got a super low budget, but it's very ambitious and does a lot with a little. There's a lot of blood in this one between the monster as the blood drawing scene. The big monster at the end was a little hokey, but overall, it was really pretty good. We both, I think we both liked it, didn't we? I did, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And did we watch a short film this week? We did. It was called The Rotting of Casey Culpepper, a brand new one this year. Written and directed by Daniel Slotgy. Stars him, also Kelsey Strouch and Liliana Ketchman. 13 minutes, 22 seconds, and you can watch the entire thing on YouTube. There's a link in the show notes. What happens? Well, Lonnie and his da- uh, Lonnie and his daughter Casey play cards, but then hear something loud in the attic. It's here. It's back, she points out. I'm sorry for putting you through this. Casey vomits. She has leukemia. And Lonnie gets locked out of the house, or does he? And if that's him out in the car, who's that rattling the doorknob? It's me, leukemia. Yeek. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an obvious metaphor for a girl battling cancer, but they kind of personify the disease. So it's, it's weird and creepy. And just when you think you beat it, it comes back. Sometimes. Battling real monsters is way more fun than the cancer kind of battle. And the lighting and visual effects are very nice. The creature makeup and the music are really well done. There is an actual creature. There is, yeah. Whether it's metaphorical or not, that's up to you. But there's something to see here. It was pretty cool how it was done. Yeah, yeah. And that takes us to our next real movie, 2006's Skinwalkers. Directed by James Isaac, written by James DeMonico, Todd Harthen, James Rodé Rodriguez, and stars Jason Bear, Elias Cotillas, and Rona Mitra. Hour and 50 minutes, trailer in the show notes. Spoiler free, what happens? Well, this one focuses on the action while keeping the horror elements simmering in the background. It's very action oriented. What if we had a werewolf movie with five minutes of werewolves at the end? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, well, there's some wolfing along, okay, it's more wolfing than along the way, too. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of wolfing. And even when they're in their human form, they're kind of wolfy a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's well acted, it moves well, and the effects are pretty good. And the story is a little predictable, but it was entertaining. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe you like this one better than I did. I think so. Yeah. Well, we are told that a war has been raging between those who want the curse to end and those who embrace the powers of the beast. According to legend, a 13-year-old boy will bring an end to all the skinwalkers. So immediately we've got one of those chosen one stories yes we do a man runs through the forest encountering dead bodies along the way he sees how close the pursuer is and tries to burn his map he's soon captured and awakens hanging upside down surrounded by four people they have his map and the woman says that they will track down the other camps and kill the boy it's already begun says the hanging man before they kill him we find this boy or it's the end of us she demands Somewhere else, a group smiles that there are only four more days. They go into the basement, and three of them get put into very elaborate restraints. Then the power goes out, and the only free man goes back up to check it out. He dies, and the other hunters come downstairs to interrogate the three who are already restrained. Where is the child? Varric is the leader of the hunters, and Sonia is worried that they'll soon be plain old humans again. Elsewhere... Will and Rachel take care of young Tim, who I'll bet Tim is the special child. He's the chosen one. He's having a seizure. Tim has premonitions, and his mother shows him the red moon outside. Will says that the moon is exerting more and more power, and Tim will probably get worse before it's over. Rachel tells Jonas that she and Tim need to leave the group soon, and Jonas's dead brother is Tim's father. Rachel drives into town, and everyone asks if Tim's doing better. She thinks it's crazy that everyone in the town knows their business. But meanwhile, Varric and his gang load up and head to town, along with their pet hawk. Hawk! Hawk! So Varric are the bad guys, and Tim and his protectors are the good guys. Yippers. Yeah. Tim and Nana are shopping in town, and the hawk spots them first. Nana spots Varric and looks stunned. Then the old lady pulls out a big pistol, and Varric shoots her. The mailman pulls out a shotgun. 
The shopkeeper pulls out a shotgun. Everyone in this town is armed, but they're all really lousy shots. <laughs> Most of the good guy characters jump in a truck and drive off, leaving badass Granny Nana behind, and we see that she's extremely bullet resistant. Yeah, she's a tough one. Jonah relates the werewolf stuff to Rachel about Tim. It's all going to happen in three days. Yeah, this whole time Rachel had no idea, all this time, living in a town full of werewolves. And, you know, she was that oblivious. She's a special kind of oblivious. <laughs> yeah. We're cursed. We kept you in the dark all these years for his safety. And he tells Tim that they're all werewolves. That night, the truck continues on with all the skinwalkers in restraints in the back. Will, an old Native American, explains, My people have been taking care of these people for a long time. He's like their Renfield. Right. Rachel watches them all turn in the back of the truck, so she believes the whole story now. And in the morning, Will releases all of them once they revert to human form. Tim passes out, so the group takes him to the hospital. The nurse says Tim has a very unusual blood type. Because he is the chosen one. Tim says we need to leave. Yes, the bad wolves are already in the building. Sonya goes into the room with Tim and Rachel and attacks them. And there's another gun battle as fewer of the good wolves make it back to the truck. Varric calls Jonas brother. A surprise we saw coming a mile away. Mm -hmm. Rachel sees that Varric is her former husband and Tim's father. Varric didn't realize Tim was his son, but that doesn't stop him from taking Catherine, Jonas's daughter, as a hostage. A bit later, Jonas tells Rachel that he thought Caleb, or Varric as he's known today, was dead. The good guys go into a bunch of caves to hide, and the good wolves go back into the restraints in the truck for safety as one more red moon passes over. Soon. The next morning, Jonas figures out that son-in-law Adam has gone after Catherine alone, and he finds her and brings her back. Why would they let her go so easily? I know, I know. Yeah, I know I knew, too. I knew, I knew. Yeah. <laughs> she says Varric stood up for her and let her live. But she doesn't remember all the details. Yeah, the thing is, if they eat flesh, they uh, lose control and uh, aren't good aren't good werewolves anymore. Yeah, you can control, control it and be a good werewolf until you eat flesh, until and then you, you become a bad wolf. You eat human flesh or wolf flesh, or you know. Then yeah. So guess what they fed her? We don't know that for well, sure. Well, this point. but that was the assumption. Yeah. yeah, that that was the reason they 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 messed her up and yeah. Night falls, and Catherine starts acting strangely as the others get into restraints. She kills Will, and she's going to kill Adam and Jonas. She's turned bad. Adam's got a gun, but he won't shoot her. She has no trouble shooting him, though. Jonas tries to talk her into fighting the hunger. Jonas is finally able to reach his gun, and he shoots her. The truck runs off the road as the three remaining biker wolves approach. We only have to make it till midnight, Jonas explains to Rachel and Tim as they walk to a nearby farm. Jonas locks them inside a steel barn and goes outside to fight. Jonas and Varric fight in werewolf form while Sonia goes after Rachel and Tim. Sonia loses pretty quickly, but then Varric and Rachel have a staring contest. They used to be married. And they still have feelings. He slashes her before Jonas returns to continue the battle. Jonas can only win by biting Varric, which immediately turns him evil. He's a flesh eater now. Yes, he is. And not the sparkly kind. No, no, he's not. <laughs> Rachel shoots Jonas several times. Varric gets up, not dead at all, and the clock strikes midnight, and the moon gets bright red. Varric bites Timmy, and the bite makes Varric sick. The moon turns white, and now Rachel, Tim, and Varric slash Caleb are a family again. He got cured. Mm -hmm. Tim's blood is the cure for the werewolf curse. Okay. Okay, the prophecy has been fulfilled. So all the werewolves are still out there unless they yes. get an injection of Tim's blood. Yes, but that's how it, kind of how it ends. They're, they're traveling underground and letting it known that the cure is available to those who want it and... They're seeking out the others to inject them with a little blood, whether they want it or not. Hmm. So, yeah. Well, the idea of a civil war among werewolves is pretty cool. The acting is good, and the action scenes and special effects are decent also. The story doesn't really hold many surprises, though. If Tim's blood is the cure for were werewolfism, then why wait for that one particular night when he was born with that blood? Because prophecy. 
I don't know. All right. Because, you know, because that's how the magic worked. <laughs> we never really see anyone transform into a werewolf. There's no transformations here. But the makeup effects are pretty good for the wolves we do see. Still, they could have put in a transformation scene, so that's usually the main thing in a werewolf film. <laughs> that's always what I want to see. They, 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 yeah, there's there's some wolfiness, but yeah. We don't the camera see the looks actual, away and then boom, they're a wolf. Yeah, we don't see yeah. You know, actual changes. Yeah, It's well made. It's a budget thing. It never gets boring, and it looks good, but the story is completely predictable. Pretty much. Once yeah. you know it's a chosen yeah. one story, you know where it's going to go. Yeah. What's next? Uh, Colossus, the Forbin Project, which was a 1970 movie. Supercomputer AI. Uh huh. Height of the you know Cold War was still a thing. The USSR was still a thing. AI wasn't really a thing. AI wasn't a thing yet, but computers were, and you know this was something to be afraid of. Computers and are scary. So they they made this little you know horror horror movie thriller. You know, yeah. Directed by Joseph Sargent, written by James Bridges and D.F. Jones, stars Eric Braden, Susan Clark, and Gordon Pinsent. Hour and 40 minutes. It is an old one, so if you haven't seen any of it and don't know much about it, there's a trailer in the usual place on the show notes. And if you've ever been a fan of the soap operas, Eric Braden has played uh, Victor Newman for decades. Thousands of years. The Young and the Restless. Thousands of episodes. Thousands of episodes, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So that was interesting seeing him. I, I don't think I'd ever seen him in anything except Young and the Restless. Uh, you know. The third Planet of the Apes movie, he was the bad guy. Oh, he was? Yeah. Oh, he okay. was the one who killed the two apes on Earth. Oh, okay. I don't remember that. All yeah. Right. That's okay. about the only thing I've seen him in okay. other than this. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen that apes movie. Spoiler yeah. free. The technology is the big and clunky stuff of 50 plus years ago. But there is a cautionary tale about artificial intelligence that is probably a lot more relevant today Mm -hmm. as we move closer to machines having a mind of their own. It's very well made and was an interesting watch. So the Cold War has changed a good deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Technology has to change a bunch. Technology has advanced a lot, yeah. But the basic idea here could still hold up. Yes. What happens? Well, we watch a montage of 1970s computer technology, the latest and best that they had, the tapes, the reels, the counters, clickety-clackety, teletype fonts, which shows us the credits. And we open to a huge room full of blinking lights, looks to be about half a mile long. It's a giant complex. And Dr. Forbin closes some insane security doors before retracting a bridge and activating radioactive safeguards. Outside the giant giant sub-mountain complex, scientists in the military shake hands for the press photographers, and Forbin shakes the president's hand for the cameras. This is the the Colossus. And we're told that with these doors shutting, no one can go inside again. Which is such a lame design. What if something breaks? This is 1950s technology. Tubes go bad. You know, circuitry boards break and... Self-repairing. Okay, self-repairing. They don't actually say that, but that's the only way they could get around it. They gloss over that, but, you know, things break. It's a security protocol. These (laughs) giant doors, there's radiation inside that's just, you know, just opened. And And it's like permanently sealed. Yeah, you can never go inside to turn this thing off, which is just brilliant. Which is, you know, like their their first mistake, yeah. (laughs) Well, the president says this is the greatest security measure ever taken. And now all they have to do is tell the people about it. The next day, he announces Colossus to the world, which is a computer that can emotionlessly analyze millions of factors at any time and respond defensively if the evil Soviets or anyone else attacks. So they put it in charge of the entire defense of the U.S. Well, Charles Forbin shares the details. Colossus fills the inside of a mountain in Colorado and is connected to all the nukes and weapons and sensors that we have. They don't make its location a secret, since Colossus can defend itself and is impenetrable. And in short, there's no way in. No human being can ever touch it. Perfect. Yeah. He insists that Colossus is not capable of independent thought. It's just a smart machine. And they, you know, it does what they tell him. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, during the president's party, Colossus interrupts with a message saying, there is another system. And that kind of puts a gavash on the party. Well, the Soviet ambassador calls. It turns out they have a similar system on their side. It's called Guardian. 
What a coincidence. Yeah. Forbin says that Colossus shouldn't be able to know about that other system, but since it does, it's working better than intended. See, this is a good thing. For a while, he, he keeps putting a spin on, on these things. See, see, it's working. It's, it's smarter than it's, we it's, thought. It's good. Yeah, it's good that's doing this. <laughs> Up to a point. <laughs> well, Colossus orders them to connect it to the Soviet computer. CIA director uh, Gruber, uh, he makes excuses about not knowing about Guardian. He doesn't know where the other system is located, but Colossus does. Forbin thinks, ah, it should be safe, and maybe even a good idea to let Colossus communicate with Guardian. Guardian speaks Russian, so the two computers immediately develop a machine language of their own that only they can understand. What are, what are they talking about? We don't know. We don't know. But, but <laughs> it's probably okay. Let them do it. Yeah. Well, the Soviets call, and they don't like that they don't know what the machines are talking about. The president agrees and decides, yeah, maybe both machines should be turned off before they share something too secret with the other side. Dr. Kuprin, the Russian scientist in charge of Guardian, calls Forbin. So they switch off the communication simultaneously, cuts off the connection between the computers. But both computers want their communications restored. If link not restored, action will be taken, Guardian threatens. So it launches a missile at the USSR. Uh, and that's okay, because Guardian has also launched its own missile at Texas. Well, that escalated quickly. Yeah. So they can't stop the missiles, so they restore the quick link between the two computers. And Colossus intercepts the missile heading to <laughs> Texas, but the other one is too late, and it hits the target in the USSR. Oops. Oops. But that's okay, the Soviets cover it up, saying it was a meteor strike. Wiped out the whole town. What can you do? Well... Forbin goes to meet with Dr. Kuprin in Rome in person, so the computers can't listen in. It appears that Colossus has assimilated Guardian to make itself even more powerful. They're basically one computer now. And the Americans pick up for Forbin when Colossus demands it, and it orders the Russians to kill Kuprin because he's no longer needed. And the Russians do it. When Forbin returns to the base, Colossus essentially makes him a prisoner. The Russians aren't necessarily the bad guys here at this point. Mm -hmm. The computers are doing it, and they have no choice but to go along with it. Yeah, because it's got all the weapons under its control. Yep. Yeah. Do this, or I'll nuke one of your cities. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, Forman knows he's always being watched, so he arranges with Dr. Cleo Markham to be his mistress. He figures he can arrange some private sexy time with her to pass messages. And they install cameras everywhere so that Colossus can see. Colossus does allow him to have a woman four nights a week, and he starts to build a voice for the computer. So, Cleo comes over as scheduled, and they do pretend to be lovers. They dance and talk, and Colossus carefully watches for any sign of deception. Colossus requires that they get undressed in the living room so it can make sure they aren't passing anything. And when alone, though, uh, you know, they could still be passing notes. It just depends on where you stick them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they, they do have a, supposedly, you know, the bedroom is off limits to Colossus. So they're alone. She reports that they have an idea. They're going to try to feed it too much data and overload it in a few days. She doesn't think that'll work, but it's all they've got. Well, a general comes up with a plan to replace the warheads in the nuclear missiles with duds but that would take three years. So on their next date, Cleo keeps Forman up to date, and, well, you know, as long as they're here naked in bed, you know, we, well, why, why not just, you know, go through with this? So they do become lovers for real. Well, now Colossus can speak. It wants all the, all the missiles to be realigned and pointed at countries that aren't under its control. So it, it controls America, controls Russia, so but, let's just take care of everybody yeah, else. Yeah, let's, let's control everybody. So manual realignment of the missiles means they can replace the circuitry with some that Colossus can't control. And it won't take three years now. They have a way out. Yay! They go with this plan and start doing it. Well, doctors Johnson and Fisher go with that plan to attempt to overload Colossus, giving it, you know, just incredible computations and impossible things. Well, it sees through that and it doesn't work. And Colossus has them shot. 
It wants a new facility built on the Isle of Crete. The whole island. The entire island, yes. So all those people living there will have to be, have to move. And Forbin tries to argue that and say, well, that's not my problem. That's a human problem. On Friday, Colossus plans to get all the TV and radio shows on Earth to declare its intentions. He's going to have one worldwide broadcast. It says it knows all about the warhead sabotage, so it detonates a few on the ground to teach them all a lesson. Don't do anything against me again or else I'll blow them all up. And Colossus states that he is in charge of everything. He will build and learn more, and humanity will worship him as he discovers the secrets of the universe. We can coexist, but only on my terms. Sounds like an old Star Trek plot at that point. A little bit. We yeah. will worship the computer. Yes, or else. Yeah. <laughs> Do as it says. <laughs> yeah. Well, the technology and visuals here are quaint at best. But the idea behind the film is probably even more valid today than it was 53 years ago. The acting is fine, but not great. The production values are pretty good considering the age of the film. See, and I thought the acting... They used a lot of real computers in this. was quite good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, the film has been cited as one of the inspirations for The Terminator and also other stories such as War Games. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Oh, yeah. 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 But I had never, uh, never even heard of this before. Okay. I, oh. I remember this being on TV quite often in my teen years. Okay. Yeah, I missed it. It okay. was good. You should check it out. Everybody should check yeah. it out. Yeah. Okay. And then over at horrorbulletin.com, we watched Fulci for Fake, the mm -hmm. uh, pseudo documentary, and The Munster's Revenge, 1981, the pseudo comedy. <laughs> yeah. And the final appearance of Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis and Yvonne DiCarlo as the Munsters. And they are all dead now. They are, yeah. 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 And it was weird when they recast the. Uh, youngsters um because because they were they had clearly aged but i guess they're age i mean their characters the characters were ageless the actors had aged clearly but the dracula frankenstein don't age yeah yeah they had a, a new you know daughter and uh kid that were still you know they're they're the the, the new actors were their same age yeah. yeah they would they probably just didn't want to deal with like a you know, a 25-year-old Eddie Munster or something like that. Cause yeah. Who the heck that's is what that? We don't recommember him. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it had some serious problems. And supposedly Fred uh, Fred Gwynn? Yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. He wasn't on board with it, but I guess they made him a financial offer that he couldn't refuse. At some point, money talks <laughs> louder than you're not wanting than to do Than your reluctance. Yeah. 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 All right. And that is it for this week. Next week, we're going to have four more movies in a short. Mmm, candy. Candyman. It's going to be a sweet week. We're going to watch the original 1990s version of Candyman and its two sequels. And we're also going to watch the 2021 remake or reboot or requel or whatever requel. it is of uh, Candyman 2021. Mm -hmm. We'll also have a couple of bonus films and a short for you. In the meantime, I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. We'll see you next week. See ya. See ya.